Essentially, as I said, it's a kind of mirror to the story of um, uh, Mrs. Brown, Her Majesty Mrs. Brown in America, in which there's this close friendship between John Brown and Queen Victoria. This is later on, which she's, again, she's isolated, she's lonely, and she finds this friendship, um, which is at the centre of uh, Victoria and Abdul, which is odd because it's it, this isn't a story that I knew before, but you had said that you did, because strangely enough, your brother had made a documentary about it. So, um, I mean, the first thing to say is it is very likeable. It's likeable not least because it's got uh, performances that it's very easy to engage with. I mean, Judy Dench has, you know, clearly played this character before and loves this. Loved this character before. You mentioned the early scenes in which she's at these uh, these sort of state dinners, in which the the joke is that she eats really fast and nobody else can start eating until she's started, and they have to stop as soon as she's up. And there's a lot of silent comedy in that, which I like. And she made the joke when she was talking twenty years old about the fact that she she hasn't got any lines in those things. Her her performance is to eat really fast, and she does that very well. And then I think you have very, you've got very likable performances between her and uh, Ali Fazl, as we've been. Going well, I told. mean, it's yes, except that they were clearly disagreeing because Dame Judy was saying Fuzzle. But anyway, but, whatever okay. you want to say. Well, but it's a, there, there's there's real chemistry between those two characters. I mean, the same way that there was between her character and uh, the character played by Billy Connolly, John Brown in. Mrs. Brown. You have that same, it's a sort of, you know, strange kind of chalk and cheese relationship. You brought up in that interview that apparently Stephen Frears had said to consider the demeanour of Peter Sellers' character in being there, which which is kind of difficult because that's the kind of thing that can tip over into awkward caricature, I think. But I think he doesn't do that at all. I think what he does is I can you can once you'd said that, because you said that before I saw the film, and I could see moments I can say, okay, I can see how that kind of that beatific thing is going on. But also what's interesting is that the film alludes very clearly to the fact that the, the character of Abdul may not be uh, exactly what you think. In fact, one of the things that I would have liked more is a little bit more unpicking of when we start to discover, you know, actually that his background isn't entirely how the, the way he may have presented it. And there's a moment in which it looks like everything's going to fall apart, but then that sort of that moves on a little bit because it looks like the film doesn't want to dig too deep into that because actually what it's centrally concerned with uh, is the friendship. And from the outside, it looks like the kind of film that would appeal to, you know, what's now referred to as the, the Grey Pound audience, the, the audience that flocked to see Best Exotic Marigold Hotel and turn that into a major hit. But obviously beneath that... There is this fascinating and very relevant story about this unusual situation in which you have somebody who is, and there's a point when Eddie Izzard says, you're the head of the Church of England. And uh, the, all the way through the beginning of the film, um, Queen Victoria's character is, ref, is, you know, mistakenly referring to everybody as Hindus. And then there's this conversation which says, no, I'm, I'm Muslim. And then she becomes very, very fascinated by the language, by the religion. She starts to learn Urdu. And, uh, and the film is then about that kind of close and respectful friendship between these, you know, between these two cultures that actually... I think is is portrayed in a way which, which which has more depth than perhaps the surface of the film would suggest. There's a thing at the beginning. Correct me if I'm wrong. In which it says, the, the, based on a true story, full stop. Mostly, yeah, based on and, true events. Mostly, mostly, which I found slightly distracting because I thought they were trying to have their cake and eat it. Although what's interesting is that many of the things that you think when you see the film must simply be dramatic constructs aren't i mean the really odd thing is that the the the, the things w the things which aren't factually accurate aren't the things that you'd think weren't factually accurate because the film has a sort of strange air of artifice about it even when what it's dealing with is uh, you know is real subjects um Eddie Izzard is enjoying the heck out of himself, isn't he? As doing Bertie, I mean, he's, you know, there are there are scenes in which he's when he's not speaking, when he's reacting with sort of pompous outrage, and it's it's sort of full on. But it's funny because when you said, "What are you doing next?" and the joke was, he said, "I'm doing Widow Twanky in a production in a tree." From Arthur Negus, and <laughs> and, yeah. and he put he put on twenty six pounds to do to be the Prince of Wales. Yeah. And when I did the interview wow. uh, with him last week, he's as trim yes. and looking every inch the marathon runner. It's incredible. So you yeah. would think, and if yeah. I'd had longer, we, I'd have, I wanted to, to talk about it. Because if you're a marathon runner and you have to put on that amount of weight, it must... No, that's extraordinary. Yeah, that is horrible. extraordinary. I would just wear the padding, you know. I would, yeah. <laughs> but, although I wouldn't need to, obviously. I have to say the stand-up performance for me was Adil Akhtar, who is so 
brilliant in The Big Sick. And here is plays the sort of, it's, it's almost like a sidekick role. But in fact, in many ways, it's the crucial role. It's the character from Hamid who, who, who comes with Abdul and doesn't really want to be there, suddenly f- finds himself stuck in this position that he had nothing to do with, is reduced to a level of somebody who is, is subservient and is put in sort of, as, as far as the film's concerned, fairly squalid quarters and hates being where he is. What he wants to do is, is to go home. And although it is, you know, it's a supporting performance, what he manages to do is to inject into it, firstly, humour. There's a lot of comedy. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, uh, again, what I refer to as silent comedy, sort of reaction comedy. There's real pathos because you do genuinely get a sense of sadness. And there is also subdued anger that in, there is a moment in the film which you referred to as the author's moment and what I would refer to as the kind of, you know, the Jiminy Cricket conscience. Yeah, it's moment. a little, I think this is what Stephen Frears wants us to take away from the conversation. And, and I think he plays that brilliantly. And he is a really, really charismatic performer. And I think, although it's a small role, for me, he, he was the person that, that had the most impact in the film. So I think the film is, it's likeable. It's got, a, it's strange because it's got a slightly fluffy air about it. And sp- because we'd been told at the beginning, based on true events, mostly you're inclined whilst watching it to think, well, that absolutely must be a construct. But I'm, now I'm going to go and watch your brother's documentary because it was interesting to find out that, that a couple of the things that I imagined must absolutely have been invented weren't.